Hi, I'm Casey, pastor of Quest Church, a community of grace. Thanks for making time to watch or listen to this message. If it helps you in some way, let me encourage you to do two things. First, share it with somebody else. Second, if you don't already, consider becoming a financial partner with Quest. We are 100% supported with gifts by people like you. And now, here's today's message. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, What do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. What do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Luke 9, verses 28 through 36, the transcript reading. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto the mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and two men standing with him. As the men were, as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, is it good for us to be here? Let us put of three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son who I've chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this, kept this to themselves did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. Good morning again and uh, welcome if you've just joined us. Uh, we're glad that you're here. We uh, are in this series called The Way, Following Jesus, Making Our Way Through the Gospel of Luke. And uh, let's pray before we dive in. God, we thank you for uh, these words of Jesus, this story about Jesus. And we pray that your Holy Spirit, who inspired these words to be written down, would bring these words to life today and use them to give life to us. May your word Take root in our hearts and bear fruit in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, do you know one of the most terrifying things in all of the world? It's a menu with too many options. <laughs> and uh, we, we took a short trip this last week down uh, to southwest Florida and I, I had to face down this fear at one of the re very first restaurants that we sat down to eat at. We have, a, we have this picture. It's not of me, but I feel like it's a good representation of how I felt. And maybe, maybe you have felt this way when you've sat down and you've opened up a menu and there's just more pages. There's page after page. And you're like, what, what are they? What, what's their specialty? What's the thing they're good at here? And, and I just could not decide. I, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, we're here on the Gulf Coast. Maybe I should get shrimp. But I thought, but this is Florida. Where else can I get authentic Cuban food? Or I thought to myself, this is the South. Why not some chicken and waffles? Um, decisions can be hard. I, I chose shrimp, by the way. Um, I know you were, you were dying to know. But decisions can be really hard, and especially as, as the options multiply. And you know, the word decision, it's, the, the root of that word means to cut off. Like you are cutting off all of these other options because you've committed to this one pathway. This is the thing I'm going to do. 
And today, in the passages that we've read, we see Jesus uh, urging his disciples to make a decision, uh, to make a cutting that, that would change their lives. And we face this same decision today if we want to follow Jesus. And again, just a reminder, we are reading the Gospel of Luke to answer the question, what does it look like to follow the way of Jesus? And as we look at this story today, we are going to see three things. One of them is about decision. The second one is about the depth of insight. And third is about devotion. So first in this passage, we read about the importance of decision. All four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, urge us to ask, who is Jesus? Who's this guy that says this stuff, could do all of this stuff? And that question just grows and grows as the Gospels go on. And now, Jesus presses that question on to his disciples. Who do the crowds say that I am? What have they decided about me? And, you know, they rattle off some decent guesses. If you were in, you know, Kids Quest or Vacation Bible School, these would be some okay answers. But, you know, a lot of people saw something special in Jesus. But not all of them saw him as the Messiah. Not all of them agreed with him about who he claimed to be. Not all of them agreed with what his disciples or other early Christians said about him. And the same thing happened in every generation all the way up to the present day. And people answer that question, who is Jesus, really in one of four ways. Some people uh, openly deny Jesus, like what he says about himself, what the Christians say about him, that's, that's not what I think Jesus is. Many of the Jewish leaders in Jesus' own time called him a false prophet that was leading Israel astray. Leaders like the Pharisees recognized Jesus' charisma even some of his miraculous powers. But what they said is, you know, he, he can do all this because he's in league with the devil. That, that's where he gets his abilities. And that accusation only got worse after the crucifixion because, after all, how could Jesus be the hero sent from God if he got defeated by his enemy? So some deny Jesus. Others answer that question uh, by appropriating Jesus. What I mean is they, they absorb or take from Jesus what they like, what they agree with, and, and just leave the rest behind. One example of this is um, Islam. Um, the Islamic religion does not accept Jesus as Messiah, but they do say Jesus is one of God's prophets and that you should listen to him. Uh, They, and it's kind of an, at least to me, an odd mixture of stuff. They accept his virgin birth. It's miraculous. But they don't accept that he was crucified. That he just, they say he just appeared to be crucified and die because God would never let one of his prophets die in a shameful way like this. Now, there are other religions like the Baha'i faith or Mormonism um, that do the same thing. Let's take what we like from Jesus, and we'll kind of add some other stuff in. But it's also true of of many other people, Uh, many people who may just be Christian in name only or not Christian at all. They may say, I I believe in Jesus, uh, but not all the stuff that the Christians say about him, that the the church down the road says, that I'm I'm going to kind of do what I do what I want, do things my own way. So they appropriate Jesus. A third answer to that question, who is Jesus, is just to ignore the question altogether. Just don't don't try to answer it. Just just don't bother. And and what you find in history is that this is the strategy of many intellectuals or or very powerful people who are very comfortable with their life. For example, Acts chapter 17, Paul the Apostle goes to the Greek city of Athens. And there he starts talking to a bunch of intellectuals. They were philosophers. And that, you know, hey, you've got some ideas. Let's hear what you've got to say. But most of them scoff 
when he mentions the resurrection. Life after death in a body? Well, that doesn't fit their worldview. So they just, you know, ignore Jesus. We don't need to listen to any of this. You'll find many modern scholars who study Jesus or history and kind of do the same thing. They can tell you more about the Bible or the first century than most of your average churchgoers. Um, they, they look at Jesus from all these, these different angles. But if you press them about whether or not Christianity is true, well, they'll, they'll deflect that question. Well, you know, I, that, that's a theological question. I'm not a theologian. I'm, I'm a historian or, you know, I, I study economics. So you see three answers, deny, appropriate, or ignore. But there is a fourth option, a fourth answer. And, and it happens when Jesus makes this question personal to his disciples. All right, I know that that's what the crowds have said about me, but what about you, my 12? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, no surprise, steps up, and he makes a profession of faith. In other words, he agrees with Jesus. You are the Messiah. You are the one that God has sent to save us. Who do you say that I am? And and like it or not, that is the question that all of us have to face. Sure, we could deny uh, we could deny uh, Jesus, we could appropriate the parts we like, we could ignore the question, or we could agree with him. We can make that profession of faith. You can accept that Jesus is who he says he is, accept what he has done for you, and pledge allegiance to him as Lord. Either way, though, you have to make some kind of decision in response to this question. Um, nobody can do that for you. Nobody can trust Jesus for you. Christian parents, we can claim faith for our kids up to a point, but at some point, they have to say yes to Jesus themselves. And by the way, no decision is a decision. Go back to the restaurant analogy, right? If, if I am so uh, stumped by all of the stuff on the menu... Um, eventually, dinner time's going to end. The restaurant's going to close. There will be a point where I don't get to make a decision, but I've made one by not making one. And you know, it can be really tempting to push off decisions. It can be tempting to push this decision back because, well, I have questions that need to be answered first. Or I just want to delay things for a little while to keep my options open. Well, that's why we are reading these two stories together today from Luke chapter 9, because we see when we get to what's called the transfiguration, one of the consequences of making that decision to profess faith in Jesus. So we've talked about the decision. What we're going to see here is the depth of insight that happens after that. So eight days after Peter professes faith in Jesus, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up to this mountainside to pray. And verse 29 says, the appearance of Jesus' face changed. In verse 32, they saw his glory. He's changed, transfigured. There's there's this light that's just emanating from him. And if you you read the Old Testament, you recognize this. This is what happens when God shows up, when God's presence is just thick in the atmosphere. And they glimpsed the glory that Jesus had before his incarnation and that he's going to have again after his resurrection. And they even see Moses and Elijah. I've never figured out how they know that's who it is, but they say it. Maybe Jesus told them later on. That was Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah show up as if to say that the entire Old Testament is putting its stamp of approval on Jesus too. But what really caught my eye is this throwaway line in verse 33. The three disciples, they wake up, they see Jesus. They're not really sure what to do. Peter's like, oh, let me try this. And in verse 33, Luke says, 
Peter did not know what he was talking about. Didn't know what he was saying. Now, why do I find that so interesting? Why does verse 33 matter so much? Well, I think it matters because, remember, Peter was the one who made the commitment to Jesus. He's the one that makes that profession of faith. You are the Messiah. And after he makes that decision, that's when he gets to see the glory. That's when he sees Jesus a little more clearly. Do you know what glory is? It's not just the light shining off of Jesus. When we talk about someone's glory, we're talking about their significance, their importance, the heaviness that, that just is who they are. And it's after he makes that profession of faith that he gets to see Jesus a little more clearly. But even then, even then, he doesn't know everything there is to know. He doesn't know everything about Jesus. He doesn't see him perfectly and clearly. But he does see him better. All of which is to say that the depth of insight follows the decision. The depth of insight follows the decision. Why? Because there are some things that you and I only know after we've made the commitment. Anselm of Canterbury was this big Christian thinker back in the 11th century, and he called this faith seeking understanding. In other words, he was saying there are some things that you and I will only understand about God, about life, once we have made the commitment of faith. You, you will only understand some things about following Jesus once you've committed to following him. And we see this in other areas of our life, too. We see this principle at work. Married people, you, you've experienced this. Now, some people want to keep their options open. They don't want to marry. They don't want to commit. They don't want to settle down with one person. Other people um, take the try-it-before-you-buy-it approach. You know, well, how can I know what life together is going to be like unless we live together? One of the many problems with that idea is that there are some things about your partner and yourself that you will not learn until you've made the commitment. There are things that I only understand now after being uh, married 20 plus years that my 21-year-old self did not understand when he said, I do. One of my theology professors used to say, the reason why we make you say your marriage vows in front of a group of witnesses is because you really have no idea what you're signing up for when you say, I do. <laughs> so that when you're like, I don't know about this. No, 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 I was there. You made the commitment. You got you, you, you to stick to it. But the depth of insight follows the decision. Some of you may remember reading the Choose Your Own Adventure books. Any of you remember these, these books, Choose Your Own Adventure? Right? Johnny is standing there, and he, he's in the tunnel, and he, there's door number one, door number two. If he, if he goes through door number one, turn to page 67. If it's door two, go to page 89. You don't know what's going to happen until you commit or cheat. You know, it's really easy to flip pages, Right? But theoretically, the depth of insight in this case follows the decision to go through one of those doors. Pick any area of interest, and you see this at work, don't you? Uh, you, could, you, could study, you could study all about the ocean. You could look at pictures of the ocean. You could watch videos of it. You could say, I want to listen, Siri, I want to listen to sounds of the ocean as I sleep. But all of that is still not the same is when you decide to actually jump into the water. There's, there's a level of knowledge that you get only after you've made the commitment to get in that ocean yourself. Or take any other area of interest. Take baking, for example. You can watch the great British baking show or Cupcake Wars or all of them. You can eat all the cupcakes you want. You can memorize all of the recipes and all of the books. But until you decide to get your hands and your kitchen dirty and go in there and start to bake for yourself, there is a depth of insight that you won't have 
until you commit to trying baking for yourself. The depth of insight follows the decision. And Peter, Peter only got to see Jesus more clearly, not completely, but more clearly after he made that commitment. You are the one God picked to save us. And you and I will see Jesus better by stages because understanding follows faith. Glory follows the profession of faith. Depth of insight follows the decision. And there are those moments where we have a decision to make, but maybe for whatever reason we've been putting it off. And maybe today there are some of us that need to make that decision. For some of us, maybe it is making that decision to commit to Jesus. You, you've kind of hung around the Jesus people for a while. You've been to church, but maybe you've never made that commitment. Doesn't mean you have all your questions answered. But maybe like Peter, you know enough to say, you're the Messiah. I'm going to follow you. I'm, I'm going to throw in my lot with you. My, my fate is going to be decided by you. I pledge allegiance to Jesus. Others may be ready to go public with their faith through baptism or, or even baptizing their children. Others may need to publicly reaffirm your faith after some time away from following Jesus or time away from the church. Others may decide it's time to put down roots in a Christian community, in a local church. It's so easy today to church shop. You don't even have to leave your living room. It's like, what's on, which church is on YouTube today? But maybe you are ready to say, this is my church home. I want to publicly be identified with this people. I want to make it succeed. Or maybe you already call this your church home, but you're ready to step up your engagement to another level. Some of you have already been following the way of Jesus for a while, but you sense the Holy Spirit nudging you to step out and serve in some new way. Maybe it's some new call to ministry or to volunteer in some area where you've never done that before. Maybe it's just you sense God calling you to some new spiritual discipline like Bible study, and you're like, you know, I wish I understood this more, but until you make the decision, the commitment to read it and study it, that insight eludes you. You're ready to know what you can only know after committing. Now, we've talked about the decision. We've talked about the depth of insight that follows. But there's one more thing to see in this story, and that is devotion. But not our devotion. Not Peter's, James, or John's. The devotion of Jesus. It, you probably noticed that, that Jesus is the center of attention here, right? The disciples are like, well, what is happening? They're asleep for half of it, for goodness sake. And notice, it's not their prayer that makes a difference up on the mountainside, it says, while Jesus was praying, then he was transfigured. And most interesting of all, when Moses and Elijah show up, it says in verse 30 that they were talking about Jesus' upcoming departure. Now, you may be able to pick up on the fact that but what, what, Jesus' departure, where is he going? Maybe they're talking about his death, resurrection. And they are. But it's, but it's even more than that. Because you see, if, if you could read what Luke wrote in Greek, because he wrote in Greek, his word for departure is actually Exodus. Moses and Elijah were talking about his upcoming Exodus. Think about that. Whose story in the Old Testament is all over Exodus? It's Moses. Moses is there talking Moses, the man of the Exodus, is talking to Jesus about Jesus' upcoming Exodus. 
Moses had led Israel to freedom. Jesus was about to bring about the true and lasting exodus because he's going to bring freedom to everybody. In other words, they were talking about his devotion. And it's his devotion, what he does, that makes our decision matter. Our decision to follow him matters because of his devotion to go to the cross. His faithfulness is what makes our faith matter. And if that's his commitment to us, then why would we ever doubt making a commitment to him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this story about Jesus and this professing faith in him and because of that, seeing his glory. God, we pray that wherever we are in our journey, that you would give us the courage to take the next step, especially that next step of faith whether we're exploring Jesus with greater intensity or making that commitment or going public with baptism or putting down roots in a church home or or saying yes to some call to serve that you've given us, help us to take that next step. And we pray this in the name of Jesus, whose devotion and faithfulness makes ours matter. Amen.